Hello everybody, this is Joe Minardi talking to you about some more point of care ultrasound and today we're going to go through some basic second and third trimester of these later pregnancy stages. We often talk, at least in emergency medicine, a lot about first trimester pregnancy because that's when we're very worried about ectopic and that's high stakes, high risk is also something we just see a lot. But we also see in emergency medicine and in primary care and lots of other specialties, we see some patients in later, second and third trimester with problems where ultrasound can really help us out a lot. And what I, what I hope to do is show you how with a little bit of practice and some just basic introductory knowledge, you can really figure out what's going on with some of these patients and hopefully a lot of time reassure them or if you can't reassure them, you can figure out what you need to do quickly and at the bedside, save time, and sometimes save lives and even resources. So let's get right in there. So I'm going to start by just giving you the summary. There's a couple of things that you're going to need to look for and get in the habit of, and practice of looking at every time. And it's the head, the heart, quick look at that placenta. I want you to be able to figure out the fetal age eyeball the fluid and ask yourself, is that baby moving around at all? That's it. This is not complicated, not complex stuff. We're looking at some basic, simple things to figure out what's the basic health of the baby. Is it there and alive? Is it in imminent danger or not? And then for more advanced stuff, that's again, topics for another day. But at the immediate bedside, simple basic things that almost anybody who can use an ultrasound machine should be able to answer. The complaints, indications, things that you're going to see, usually seems like what I see is the patient who comes in and they're looking for inpatient drug treatment and when you ask them about their periods they say, oh, I don't know, I haven't had a period in a while, but there's absolutely no way I'm pregnant and then you decide to look and they're you know, 26 week pregnant. So uncertain dates is a common reason to take a look. Someone will say maybe they're pregnant but they have no clue how far they are. So you can look quickly and at least get an estimate of how far along they are. And then sometimes you'll see the decreased fetal movement, you'll see the very typical abdominal pain, patients with vaginal bleeding, or you have a patient maybe they're in pending labor or you're worried that they might be in pending labor and you want to know where is the head and what should I do and that's going to influence your decision making. So things that we are not going to talk about, we're not talking about today detailed placental evaluation, placental abruption. Uh, you can identify by ultrasound but ultrasound is not capable of excluding this diagnosis, so we're not, we're not even going to talk about that today. Placenta previa, I do think this is something that we're capable of at the point of care in emergency medicine and in primary care, but it's beyond what we're talking about today. That's not a topic uh, that we're covering now. We're not going to talk about detailed anatomic surveys or fetal anomalies. We're not talking about complete biophysical profile or an evaluation of fetal distress. Again, those are topics for another day. This is a basic is the baby in there, alive, and is it in imminent danger? So just basic starter things, the probe, we're going to usually use the wide curvilinear transducer. If all we have is the phase array, that will suffice. We want to make sure that we're in an OB setting. So we're going to talk about some things measuring dates specifically that just won't work if you're not in an OB setting. Patients usually going to be supine, maybe they're in the left lateral position, and be nice to them, put their head up a little bit. So we're going to talk about basic views, and what, you, what we're going to start with is the uterine axis. The uterus has a long and transverse axis, so we're going to start by looking at that, but then we're going to switch to the fetal axis, because the fetus, depending on where it's lying, it has its own axis. So we're going to figure out where its head is, and that'll help us figure out where its heart is and gestational age. In these uterine axes, we'll be able to figure out where's the placenta and get an eyeball feel for is the fluid adequate or not. And then in the fetal axis, we'll identify presentation, the heartbeat, and make an estimate on their gestational age. So again, we're going to start by considering the uterine axis, sagittal transverse. And then the first things we'll identify in the baby, and usually we like to jump right to baby and heartbeat, and that's okay. That's reassuring to us, and when moms get to see that on the screen, that's reassuring to them, so that's okay. But in the sagittal transverse uterine axis, those are the places to most easily and first identify where's the placenta, and eyeball the fluid, and then we can jump into the head and the heart and the fetal age. So that's usually kind of the order that I go in. So just remember, th this is easy stuff, so if we're talking about mom and the uterus, this is what a transverse uterus is going to look something like, and here it's tilted off to one side a little bit, which is okay, and then here we have a baby, and we don't know 
what axis of the baby we're in yet. We're not paying attention to that yet. All right, hold up a second. Before I go on any further, I just want to point out that as you're looking at your sweeps transverse and sagittally through the entire uterus, make sure that you account for all the fetuses that are present within the uterus, count them, keep track of them, and then repeat some of our subsequent steps for each fetus that you find. So for each fetus that you find, find its head, find its heartbeat, try to figure out which position it's lying in, and roughly estimate what's the fluid look like and where's the placenta. And then you'll even get into situations where there are maybe dichorionic or monochorionic that's really not that critical. At the bedside, you just want to know how many are there and are they all alive and looking fairly viable at the moment. All right, that's enough. Let's move on. And here, at least in this cartoon, we can identify placenta here looks to be kind of lateral. And then a sagittal or longitudinal view of the uterus is indicator towards the mother's head. And in this case, we see a cephalic presentation, but again, we're paying attention to the uterine axis first and then we'll get to the baby. Then, after we've evaluated the uterus in sagittal and transverse axes, we wanna figure out, what I like to do is I try to find a sagittal view of the baby or some kind of profile and figure out where's the head. Because if you're looking at, and I'll show you examples, cross sections and you're not super advanced, sometimes a fetal abdomen doesn't look that different from a fetal head. So if you figure it out in a transverse fetal orientation, that will help you figure out where is the head. Okay, and then from there, it's usually easy to find the heart. And then hopefully we can find the fetal heartbeat, which you'll see here. And it's nice to just see it, and then you can measure it with M-mode as well. So here's an example where we've stuck our M-mode cursor across here, and in this case, we're on a two-beat cycle. We can get fetal heart tones, and we measure 136 beats per minute. So often that's, that's one of the first things I do. Once I figure out where's the baby, where's the heart, I'll get the heart tones and then that's reassuring to you. You can kind of take a breath, show mom, mom can take a breath, and then you can spend a few more minutes on some of these other things. And notice we're in an OB setting, otherwise this calculation probably wouldn't work. And then next I like to just figure out where is the placenta. So we've found, so this is looks like a longitudinal view of the uterus. So we have the fetus here, head, body, and legs, and here's the placenta. It looks kind of like liver. It's a little bit echogenic compared to the uterus, and we can figure out, is it anterior, is it posterior? Is it far away from the cervix? Is it, is it kind of close to the cervix? So those are things we want to try to answer. And not, not necessarily anything more advanced than that, just where is the placenta? That's what we're trying to figure out. So there it is. Looks kind of like a liver attached to the wall of the uterus, and here it's anterior. We want to differentiate that from a uterine contraction, which sometimes can be confused for the placenta. And here's an example of that. And the difference is here is if you follow this, you can see that it's almost it's continuous with the uterine wall. It's very focal, whereas here we see placenta, and it's you know it's longer, it's echogenic, it has a different echo texture compared to the uterine wall. So those are some of the clues that we can help us differentiate uterine contraction from the placenta. And remember, many of these uterine contractions, especially in the second trimester, moms don't feel these. So you can't ask mom, do you feel like contractions right now? Because they they, a lot of times they're not going to feel these, so don't rely on that. So there we are, uterine contraction. Now here is a transverse image of the fetus. And I'll just point out here that if you're not familiar or practiced a lot, this could easily look like a head and you could start measuring things on this and you'd be completely wrong by estimating dates. So that's why I like to get a sagittal view of the fetus first. And then again, the next step, I like to look at the amniotic fluid. We're not doing amniotic fluid indices at the point of care most of the time. You could if you wanted to, but I don't like to do them. I think it's uh, time consuming and not that valuable. So what I like to look for is just, is there a cushion around this baby, a cushion of fluid? And are there, if I fan through here, can I find one or two deeper pockets? But if I see this, I see the baby's got a good cushion around them and there's a little bit of space and that makes me happy. If I see something like this, where it's hard to find baby because there's no space or cushion around them, then that's really worrisome. And in most cases, especially if you're early on, uh, this is a really poor prognosis. This is a poor prognosis almost no matter what. Um, but this is low fluid or oligohydramnios. You don't need to measure anything to figure this out. If you see a fetus that's squashed within the uterus and there's no fluid cushion around it, um, this is a bad thing. And you're going to probably need consultation with your obstetrician on a patient like this. 
And now here is an example of polyhydramnios or too much amniotic fluid. Now this is not that urgent, so it's not that critical that we make this diagnosis at the point of care. However, if you notice this, it's nice to pay attention and uh, be alerted to the fact that maybe there's too much fluid. Now this can go along with some other fetal anomalies that are beyond what we're gonna talk about, but this is what that's gonna look like. Again, not that critical to diagnose immediately, but to see the whole spectrum, here's an example of polyhydramnios. Uh, fetal age, my favorite way, there are several different methods. Uh, I think the easiest and my favorite is to measure the biparietal diameter. And this is, again, you got to make sure you're in an OB setting or this will never even come up in your calculation package. Or So it's usually going to be annotated BPD. And what you want to do is find the head. And remember, find the head with a fetal sagittal axis first and then you can turn transverse and get a view of the head. You want to see the falks going right through the middle of the skull. You want to see portions of the lateral ventricles and then you want to measure perpendicular to the falks and from a leading edge of the skull to the leading edge of the skull or you can go from the middle of the skull to the middle or the ending edge to the ending edge, whatever you do. And really, if you're off a little bit, it's not that critical at the point of care to measure them at 20 one versus 22 weeks. Only if you're making decisions on viability is that really that critical. But if you're just trying to figure out are they eight weeks or 20 weeks, getting this pretty close is gonna be adequate. Just make sure you've actually identified the head and you're not looking at abdomen. Find the falks and get the head at its where it looks the widest and then measure the widest point perpendicular to the falks. And that's your biparietal diameter probably one of the most easy for anybody to apply in any situation. And if you have an OB setting on, you do that, and it will give you an estimated gestational age right there. Again, there are some others out there, but this is my favorite. And again, I'll just point out that a fetal abdomen and cross-section can look a lot like a head, so find the head in a fetal sagittal plane first. So really, that's it. Those are the things you want to know. And the other thing we didn't really show or talk about is just pay attention, is the baby moving? If you see a kick, you see an arm move, you see the head turn or it does a flip, then that's a very good prognostic indicator for that fetus. And you can tell mom, I don't see the heartbeat yet, but it's doing jumping jacks. So the baby's not in immediate distress. So you can, you can show that to a patient. That's very reassuring. So fetal movement is another thing you can look for to reassure you about the health of the baby at the point of care. So we just talked about a basic evaluation. Anybody that is got some basic ultrasound knowledge and skill can carry this kind of an exam out and make some immediate decisions or be reassured at the bedside. We talked about looking in the uterine axes, sagittal and transverse, but then also consider the fetal axis, the fetal, sagittal and transverse axes and identify both of those planes. And then the things we're looking for are very simple. Where's the head? Where's the heart? We want to measure fetal heart tones using M mode. And even later on, you can use Doppler if you want. That's okay. We'd like to figure out just where the placenta is. And really, most of the time, we just want to know where it is and is it close to the cervix or not? And then if it's too close to the cervix and we're worried about that, then we can evaluate that further either ourselves or if we need more expertise, we can, we can refer that on. We like to get an estimate of age. It doesn't have to be super specific unless for certain scenarios but most of the time we just want to know is it first second third trimester or somewhere in the ballpark is enough for what we want to know at the point of care we want to eyeball the fluid does it look adequate or not and then we want to see is that baby moving and that can be reassuring if we see fetal movement and that's really about it like i said anybody with some basic ultrasound skills can do this we can make some decisions about the immediate health or any imminent dangers to the fetus at the bedside and hopefully reassure you or help you make decisions on do you need to get some other expertise involved right away. So I hope that helps and go out and practice this. This is one thing that um, people love to see their fetus so you can practice this anywhere. Thanks.